we're here with Bob Daisley today. We're going to talk about music and uh, and the bass and have a talk about his career. So, Bob, you must be very pleased with your career so far, and I understand you have a book coming out. Can you give us a preview of what might be in it? Well, in answer to your first question, yes, I am pleased with the career. It's um, probably gone better than I ever hoped for as a youngster, but but I always had ambition. But the way it's gone, I feel very blessed that I've had the connections and, and uh, fulfilment in the career that I've had. It's been great. And and a lot of that, or most of it, will be in the book. But the book will start before my career. It'll be from my um, childhood, my first introductions to music, my first lessons in music, the, the, you know, the silly things, antics that I got up to as a kid, high school, being um, a rebellious type, being thrown out of high school, and then my first breaks in um, getting into name bands and and music that way. And it'll go all the way through in mostly um, from a musical uh, perspective, but there'll be other stuff in there as well. Right, right. And uh, what, who were your earliest influences? Who were you listening to? Um, when I first started playing, I'd... Um, Oh, probably the instrumental bands and the surfing bands and that. This is like, and I started playing guitar first uh, in 1963, um, and I was listening to the Shadows, the Shantays, the Ventures, those types of um, instrumental surfy sort of bands. Mm. Um, but uh, when I first saw an electric bass, one of the lessons that we had it was in a a sort of little um, community hall and the teacher thought it would be a good idea for the pupils to see a live band in action and when I saw the electric bass I'd, I'd been probably attending the lessons for about a year or so learnt the basic rudiments and, and of music and guitar on, on the guitar and then when I saw the bass I thought that's what I want to do, that's for me and it was um, an immediate sort of um, affinity with the instrument because it had strength it had backbone it had the rhythm but it had melody and it had warmth and it was all the things that I loved and I thought there was just no two ways about it that's what I wanted to do I mm. fell in love with the instrument you know and that was mm. so I went home and told my mum and she was always really really supportive and, and always gave me encouragement she said well if that's what you want to do we'll go and get you a bass and you can give up guitar lessons just like that you know <laughs> How did you get started with bands, playing in bands? Um, a couple of the other kids at high school um, used to attend uh, the same f uh, school lessons as I did. It was Beresford's Practical School of Music, but in another area. Um, and we got together at high school and, and started knocking up a few tunes First of all, the instrumentals and things, and then, as 1963 into 64 wore on, all the stuff from England started happening. You know, the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and and all those types of bands, mm. and uh, and that that became a big influence. Then my my first introduction to blues and rhythm and blues, because you know, like in Australia and in England and that, no, nobody was really very familiar with the black artists in America playing that real roots music. Mm -hmm. And they weren't even big names in America themselves. You know, mm -hmm. people like Muddy Waters and Sonny Boy Williamson and all, all the great bluesers, Willie Dixon, you know, they, they weren't really big names in America themselves. It was when the whites re-delivered it that, and, and people found out where it came from and loved it that they became big names themselves and yeah. got more work and more recognition. So my first introduction to the blues was the Rolling Stones, who were sort of on a crusade to introduce young people to blues and rhythm and blues, and, and thank goodness they did. Yeah. Well, oddly enough, my son said to me the other day, uh, rock music is English music. It came from England. Yeah. <laughs> and I suppose that's what... No. Yeah. <laughs> but all of those great English bands. You know? Oh, yeah. Well, see, they... they um, I suppose presented it in, in a slightly different way and, and made it more palatable for um, you know youngsters that had come from America, and then and then rec rock and roll had grown from blues and rhythm and blues, and then the, the English bands reinterpreted it and sold it back to the Americans, and mm. as, as almost like something new or or with a you know a, a new lease on life. 
Mm-hmm. Well, you were very active here in Sydney. I, I wonder what it was like here in those in days. In the 60s and that? Yeah. Well, it was a lot healthier situation than what it is now. Um, and, and music was... God, that, that one decade from 60 to 70 was, was, um, was just pure evolution of music. And you could, there was so much new stuff going on all the time. And we were spoilt for choice, you know. And, and every time you turned the radio on, there was a new type of music or a, a new, almost like a new genre. And, and it happened with fashion and thinking and all, all sorts. You know, it was a really, really active decade. It was a great time to be a teenager. Mm-hmm. It really was. Plenty of gigs? Yeah, there were lots of gigs, yeah. All, all the bands that, you know, that I was in, we used to do... Sometimes you, you'd do what they called in those days spots. You'd do a spot here and then whip over to somewhere else and do a spot there. And, you know, if, if you were in demand sort of thing, you know, some, or sometimes you'd be booked in to play at a place all night with maybe one or two other bands. Mm-hmm. So you'd do a set and then someone else would... And then you'd go back on and do another set. And there, there was so much more live music in, in those days. And you'd walk through... Oh, I don't know, through the city or through places like King's Cross and that, and you'd hear through through one long street, you'd hear maybe four or five bands playing live, you know, in clubs and pubs and... and uh, mm-hmm. yeah. So you could be playing five, six, seven nights a week if you wanted oh, to? Yeah, most bands didn't play five, six, seven nights a week. It was, it was usually the main three was Friday, Saturday and sometimes okay. Sunday. Okay. How did your experience here prepare you for your international career? Um, I, I suppose the, um, the the moving from doing covers into a band that was doing original stuff really prepared me for um, th- writing my own bass parts and, and coming up with song ideas and and being um, adventurous in in taking chances with playing. Because if, you, if you're just doing covers, if you're just playing what somebody else has already played, even if you do another arrangement of their song, it's basically this is what's been done and you're, you've got guidelines. But I think the, f- the first band I was in that did all originals was Carvest Jute in 1970. And, and that, was, that was a real good preparation to, uh, to find your way in the, in the dark, really, I suppose. I mean, we had our influences. You know, our, our influences would have been at that time, uh, Cream, Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin, a bit of Jethro Tull, anything blues orientated, mm-hmm. blues influenced stuff always appealed to me more than anything. Right. And it seems to be that because blues never dates, that anything blues orientated doesn't date either. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could put the first Led Zeppelin album on now, mm-hmm. and it'd blow youngsters out the room. You know, because it's just doesn't date. Same with Cream and the Hendrix stuff. Could you tell us how events unfolded for you in England? Uh, could you talk through the band you played with uh, uh, for anyone that's unfamiliar with your career? Mm. Um, well, originally I, I'd, I'd planned to go to England to rejoin with Carvis Jute um, because uh, Dennis Wilson and Danny Davidson had, had gone to London. I'd left the band here um, and they got over there, and after about a month, I think it was, they uh, they left here in the May seventy one. In June seventy one, they phoned me and they said the band doesn't sound the same without you. Can't get anybody to fit in like you. Would you consider coming over? And I didn't have anything going on at the time, so I thought, oh, what the heck, give it a shot. I go over. So I said, well, how soon do you need me there? As soon as you can get here. So I sold my car, I sold my amp, I got my air ticket and my passport in order and my mum even borrowed some money so I'd have some dough in my pocket because I'd spent everything on my air ticket and so I'd have a little bit when I got there. And then about a night or two before I was supposed to leave, they phoned and said, oh, it doesn't matter, we found someone. <laughs> but, you know, I, I can't be bitter about that because that's what got me over there. Yeah. And I would not have made that decision by myself. You know, a kid sitting there, I was 21, you know, you know a kid sitting there, I'd, I'd gone through some shit, you know, broken hearted, penniless, no band, no job, no anything. There's no way that I would have been sitting in the suburbs and thought, 
I know what I'll do. I'll sell everything and go to London and take a big chance. And you know, I wouldn't have done that. So the decision got made for me. So, if anything, I'm thankful for that. You know, it, it wasn't a very nice way to to have it done. But but if it had to be done, it had to be done, and that's what got me over there. So when I got there, I I, um, I had a friend there called Clive Coulson, and he was working for Led Zeppelin, and he'd been a singer with Dennis and me here in Sydney. And he and he used to always say because he got the when he was our singer he got the call from Peter Grant, come back we want you to work for Zeppelin so he got on a plane and went back to them, and he was living in London working for Zeppelin, and um, he said if you ever come over, look me up and so I I uh, hooked up with Clive and he said oh, I've got a little room you're welcome to it, it's only a little room but it's a spare room you can have it if, if you know put you on your feet, so uh, and then it was Clive that um, I was working in a restaurant. Um, and one day Clive came in, rushed in, handed me a piece of paper and he said, um, this is Stan Webb's phone number, he's the guitarist for Chicken Shack. Give him a call, he's looking for a bass player. So um, I went for an audition at um, Olympic Studios in Barnes. I didn't really know the history of that studio at that stage, I just thought it's a recording studio in London, but God... That place is steeped in history, you know. So all the fir the first four Led Zeppelin albums, Jimi Hendrix, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the oh God, you name it, they've been there. Mm. So what a great place to do an audition. But as it turned out, um, I phoned the producer. That was I think that was a Sunday afternoon. I went for that, and on the Monday I phoned the producer, and he said to me, because um, he was at the studio as well, uh, he said, I think Stan's going to keep his bass player at the moment, just for the moment. Um, so so that was that but on my 22nd birthday I went out with a mate of mine to a pub in Holland Park in London a pub that Clive had taken me to when I first went to uh, got to London and it was a place where a lot of musicians went and it was almost like Clive was saying to me you need to go here because this is where you're going to hook up with something and, and on my 22nd birthday I had a mate with me and he said oh come on let's go out for your birthday let me have a drink so we went down. We went down to the Prince of Wales in in Holland Park, which is where Clive lived in Holland Park. By that time, I was in, living in Notting Hill Gate, just up the road. And um, I was in there, and I saw Stan Webb. And I remember Stan was quite tall; he's about six one or something. And he sort of looked above people's head. He went, "Oh, all right, hello. Still want that gig? Yeah, you're in." And that was it. I joined Chicken Shack on my 22nd birthday in the Prince of Wales. It was what a birthday present. <laughs> <laughs> and from then on, it just it snowboarded. I remember Clive Clive Coulson saying to me, he said, "Look, it's it's a good opportunity. It's not the biggest band in England, but it'll put you on the scene, and other things will come from it." And they did, you know, because from Chicken Shack, I had a great time with Stan with Chicken Shack because it was <laughs> I learnt a lot about roots music, the blues, and and God, he had such a a comprehensive um, music collection, old 78s and all the old proper blues artists and really obscure stuff. And he was always digging them out, listen to this, play, you know. It was a great education, you know. Mm. And um, I went from that to Mungo Jerry. Mungo Jerry was a great experience, but um, it wasn't completely my cup of tea in music. It was more of um, Ray Dorsett, the, the guy with the sideburns and the, the singer of Mungo Jerry. Um, we all got on great together. We had a good time together. But he leant more towards sort of um, the jug band style of Yeah, of, that's of what it, they, stuff. Yeah. Mm. They sort of rocked that, uh, what did they call it, skiffle up. Yeah, they yeah. They more of a yeah, rock yeah. skiffle band. Or and, it was, and it was fun, but it was a little bit too commercial for me yeah, in part, yeah. you know. But it was a good experience. Yeah. And, I, and I wouldn't change it. You know, it was a, a fun time as well. But I, I went from that back to Stan Webb um, with Chicken Shack and he'd had another guitarist playing with him by then by the name of Robbie Blunt Robbie ended up playing with Robert Plant when Zeppelin broke up um, and I had a good time with that too and then and from there I formed Widowmaker with um, Ariel Bender from Mott the Hoople right. uh, Paul Nichols was the drummer uh, from Linda's Farm Hugh Lloyd Langton was the other guitarist from Hawkwind and the singer was Steve Ellis right. And then the second, Mark II of Widowmaker, was the same lineup except the singer was changed to John Butler, who was, who was a good singer. I actually preferred his voice. But um, f from Widowmaker, it was when I was uh, in America, I got introduced to Richie Blackmore from, you know, through Dick Middleton from, uh, from Mungo Jerry. 
hooked up with Richie. Yeah. And and from Rainbow um, went to Aussie. From Aussie, um, uh, after Lee and I were asked to leave, because people say to me, why did you leave Aussie the first time? And I just say, because I was asked to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie about it, you know. It's, you know Actually, by whom? Um, it was, see, what happened was, it was Sharon and Ozzy were looking to get rid of Lee. They didn't want Lee in the band. O- Ozzy and Lee had got on okay together at first, but Sharon and Lee hadn't really hit it off. It was just a, a wrong chemistry or something. And then it was suggested that of, you know, let's get rid of Lee and let's get rid of, and let's get Tommy Aldrich as drummer, you know, so, and I would never agree to getting rid of Lee. Not because of any loyalty to Lee or anything, I just thought it was the wrong thing to do. So, I wouldn't agree, and they kept on asking me, and eventually they got rid of us both, you know, so. Mm. But I was asked back, so there you go. But um, when when Lee and I got uh, ousted, um, Lee phoned up Mickey Box, the original guitarist with Uriah Heap. Mm. So we put Uriah Heap back together with um, Lee, Mickey Box, myself, John Sinclair on keyboards and a singer called uh, Peter Golby. And uh, we did a couple of albums with that. That was a good time as well. Uriah Heap was like, sort of like a family situation. It had a really nice vibe. We all got on well together. And there was, it was a, quite a free sort of um, expressive situation as well. Mm-hmm. And from Uriah Heap, I got called back into the Aussie fold. And then Gary Moore. Um with the Black Sabbath album. Um, lots of stuff with Ozzy, you know, called back and, and quite a bit with Gary, a lot of touring with Gary as well. Mm. Mm. And into the early 90s was when I started doing the thing in San Francisco with Jeff Watson, Carmine Apice and um, Joe Lynn Turner, the Mother's Army thing. Did about th- with three, three albums with that. Mm. Yeah, I'd like to ask you about some of the great guitar players that you've worked with. How Um, long you got? (laughs) Yeah, it's incredible. Let's start with Richie Blackmore. Right. How did the collaboration come about? Um, Well, how did I get hooked up with it? Yeah. I'd been in a band in England in in 1973, had a few big hit records called Mungo Jerry. And one of the guitarists in Mungo Jerry was a a, a guy called Dick Middleton. And... um, and Dick and I remained good friends after he'd gone from Mungo Jerry and I had. And I was in America in 1977 with a band called Widowmaker. And at the end of the, towards the end of the tour, I was in L.A. and I knew Dick Middleton had moved to L.A. with his family to stay there for a little while and he was a mate of Richie Blackmore's. He and Richie had sort of known each other since their teens. Mm. And Dick said to me, Richie Blackmore has got his own band called Rainbow now. Um, he's looking for a bass player. Would you be interested? And at the time, um, although Widowmaker was uh, it was a good band and I got on well with the guys, it was um, sometimes they, they got a bit too... Um, they wanted to have more of a good time than, than get serious about the music. And, and the music was always treated seriously, but they used to go off the wall sometimes. You know, It was like, God... Oh, and so I, I thought, well, I'm not that happy with, with the way things are going, so it wouldn't hurt to go and meet Richie. Because what Richie did, he usually wouldn't audition someone unless he knew he could, he could at least get on with them or they weren't a complete dickhead or, or something, you know, because that'd be a waste of time. So the first audition, if you like, audition, was, was meeting him and just going out, having a chat, a bit of a laugh, a few beers. And that's when he said, yeah, sure, if you want, come down and have a play. Because they'd auditioned something like 40 bass players at the time. Now, Richie was very particular about what he wanted from a bass player. Um, and he wanted somebody who played with a plectrum, a pick. Right. And I did. And he wanted that, that real precise, you know, because um, bass players that played like that, he, he wasn't really interested. He, he said it didn't have the precision he needed. So he, he really put me through the paces when I went down for the audition. I heard something about a metronome. Nah. No? No. Nah. No I'll, metronomes. No. Okay. no, I heard someone told me that he, he, he and you sat down with a metronome and just 
uh, you know, to nail timing and no, stuff. No, no, I never ever did anything like that. But what he did do was he put me through the tests with um, using the pick for long periods of time with fast stuff. Okay. You know, doing um, eights and sixteens and uh, from, with octave, okay. Okay. like that, to see if my wrist would get tired or my thumb okay. would seize up, okay. and 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 I was all right because that's how I played anyway. You know? Okay. Well, that, so that's at, that, well, at the end of that audition. He and Ronnie and Cozy, that were they were the nucleus of the band, went off into um, an office somewhere and had a little chat. Then they came back and they said, "Well, you know, you've got the gig if you want it." And the funny thing is, I said, "I'll think about it." <laughs> but but the only reason I said that is be, is is that Widowmaker was a democracy. It was a dem- democrat. It was our band, and I knew I'd be a sideman in Rainbow. And when I had already mentioned to people about the possibility of joining Richie and, and being in that situation, they said, oh, be careful. He chews people up and he'll spit them out. You could be without, you know, without a band and without a gig within three months. It might last a long time, but you might last three months. So, so I was a little apprehensive, and I did have to think about it. Mm-hmm. But I phoned Vicky, my wife, and, and she said, well, out of your fucking mind? <laughs> Just do it. Mm-hmm. But it was. It was a good, a good experience. It was a good learning experience as well. And um, and a very good stepping stone to be presented on a you know a, a higher platform with more recognition and yeah, yeah. and and it really did after you know just a few weeks of working together and rehearsing and then when the gig started it turned into a really good band it really gelled it was great yeah mm. yeah yeah guitar players would be really interested in your observations about Richie's playing Richie Blackmore's playing it was it was very original I mean he'd had he'd had his influences as well he loved yeah. Hendrix. Yeah. Loved Jimi Hendrix, um, and he loved Bach. <laughs> so you know, he's a pretty broad spectrum of, of influences. But I remember sometimes standing on the stage and just looking across at Rich and thinking, "God, is this is is great? He's entertaining me, you know." And I was part of the band because he really did have a style and a sound. You know, you know, like Jeff Beck. You hear him mm. and he plays three or four notes. You go, "That's Jeff Beck." Mm. And Richie was like that. He'd play a little. That, that's Richie Blackmore, and and he had that thing, you know. So but I wonder. Just watching that DVD on Rainbow, um, how much improvisation was in his show? It was very worked out and very rehearsed within um, so certain borders, um, and what went on within those borders could be a bit loose, but it was rehearsed, and they were set, you know. Um, Parameters, um, which uh, made it uh, bec- with with the um, the certain freeness w- within the parameters made it look a little bit more um, um, unrehearsed than what it actually was. But it was quite rehearsed. So if you saw two three shows in a row, they'd be at least similar and have yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I expect he would be a great improviser anyway. Oh, there was a certain amount of improvisation always, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but he would just choose to... But yeah, it would be sometimes yeah. a, this bit's going to go on for this length of time and another night it might go on a bit longer or, or in a slightly different way, but he'd always look to Cozy or he'd look to me or look to whoever for the cue. We're going into this bit now, so it was like that. Okay, okay. And I'd like to ask you about your highlights in that band. What, what was the highlight for you? All the highlights. I didn't have highlights, don't. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I suppose. I suppose what I really enjoyed about it, it was run like a well-oiled machine, really professional, really reliable, um, and I did learn from the discipline within the band and the seriousness. You know, and I loved it. You know, Richard was really serious about the music, and they all were in their own way, mm. and uh, and that's what I really liked. Because coming from Widowmaker, Widowmaker was a good time band, and the music was good, and I got on well, well with them. But but it was a little um, slack sometimes, you know, and and that sort of frustrated me a bit. And going into something like Rainbow, I'd say that was the main highlight of that band of of what I learnt, what I experienced, and what I felt within that well-oiled machine what were the rehearsals like with rainbow mm. oh um, very disciplined very what would a typical session be david stone the keyboard player was new 
and I was new. So it was really the rehearsals for, for our benefit. Right. So we were the ones that had to do the homework and be note perfect, ready for the gigs. I think we had about three weeks or something rehearsals in LA at the end of the um, when I left Widowmaker and went went to Richie. Um, but Richie took everything pretty seriously. I mean, he he would find out things through the grapevine. He was always sort of uh, had the radar going, you know, <laughs> and things that people mentioned in conversation or he'd read between the lines or, or whatever. And he knew that I was in my room rehearsing with tapes and, and, and practicing and getting, and he was, I, I found out that he was impressed with that. And he liked that. I know. David Stone, on the other hand, would sometimes be out partying or out at clubs and be seen and, and Richie would be thinking, you know, you're not taking this as serious as you should. But I think Richie always had a thing about keyboard players anyway. I don't know why. I don't know if it came, stemmed from old um, John Lord experiences or what, but uh, he had this thing about keyboard players. But, you know, by the time we got on the road and did our first show, it was, it was great because Richie came up to me at the end of that first show. He said, that was great. I, I know you've done your homework. So, and, and that gave me a little bit more confidence and mm-hmm. relaxed me a little bit within the band. And, mm-hmm. and you know, I, I had a good time in that band. Mm. Yeah, one of the great bands of rock history.